we're keeping the crowds to a minimum, but we do miss the children who came to Jaipur. And I hope that they're watching online, and I'm sure they're watching online, the many schools and universities and colleges across the world. And I hope that we can welcome them back in 2022. May I please invite our festival directors, Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple, to tell you a little about the amazing riches that they've put together in the mother of all festivals. This year, Anubhav and Neha, our colleagues, said to us, you are restricted. You can only invite 250 speakers. Of course, that's grown to 500. Namita Gokhale. And also to take this opportunity to congratulate Namita on her Sahitya Academy Award, which she will receive tomorrow in Delhi. Namita. Thank you, friends. Uh, he talked about the Sahitya Academy Award, and while I'm deeply honored to have received this award, which puts me in the heart of the throbbing heart of Indian literature, where I belong, and where I consider English one of the Indian languages, yet I will be here at the Jaipur Festival tomorrow, rather than in Delhi, to receive my award, because my award is you and this festival. Aaj, yaan Jaipur lot kar dil bhar aya. Itni yaade, kahaniyo ki, kahaniyo, kahani karo ki. Aaj vishwa bhar mein bhayankar yuddh ka saaya phela hua hai. Pichle do saalo mein, humari dunya badalti ja rahi hai. Hum sab ne kai dukh dekhe, kai takleefe, aur na jane kitni musibaton ka saamna kiya. In sab ke dauran, sahitya ne, sapno ne, hume sahas diya, sahara diya. Geet, upanyas, kalpana shakti, aur rachnatmatta se hume anant prerinay mili hai. कहानी बदल चुकी, कविता बदल चुकी है, कहने का, सुनने का, समझने का तरीका भी बदल चुका है, बदलता जा रहा है, परंतु लेखन का उत्सव वही है। कहानी बदल चुकी, मगर जैसे कि उसको हमें जिंदा रखना है उस कहानी को, उन कहानियों को, उन अनेक कहानियों को। महाकवि दुष्यंत कुमार के शब्द मन में गूंजते हैं। यह दिया चौरास्ते का ओट में ले लो आज आधी गांव से होकर गुजरती है यही है for those who few who don't understand Hindi it is about how the world is torn apart and how there is a a lamp lit within our hearts within our worlds within our villages which we all have to protect and the way to protect it is through literature. आप सब बुद्धि जीवियों और साहित्य प्रेमियों का जयपुर साहित्य उत्सव में हार्दिक स्वागत है। इस पंद्रह साल की यात्रा में साथ देने के लिए बहुत आभार। थैंक यू। एंड नाउ इंग्लिश। डियर फ्रेंड्स, इट इज एक्सेलरेटिंग टू बी इन जयपुर अगेन। दिस पिंक सिटी इज अ साइट ऑफ ड्रीम्स एंड मेमोरीज फॉर then returns to this sunny morning, this very sunny morning, and the new adventures ahead. Our digital edition has rolled out in all its glory. We return after a gap of more than two years to greet our live audiences, the smiling faces of those seated before me, the shared energies of human communication, of synchronous heartbeats, of non-verbal language, are hard to duplicate digitally. I welcome all of you, friends of books, lovers of literature. Thank you for being here. The clouds of war are gathered around our planet. Even as we struggle to recover from the pandemic, we are faced by disruption and chaos. Through all this, the inspirations of literature, music, poetry continue to sustain us. What we seek to share is this. Uh, in our 15th edition, it is courage, it is belief. Joy and laughter are a form of courage, and creativity is the most life-affirming of all activities. Our literature festival will be immersive and experiential, a celebration of heart, mind, and intellect. The pandemic and the swift scientific responses have been at a planetary level. 
through the world of reading and writing of how we share our stories, uh, we reflect the concerns of the world around us, as well as the eternal questions and timeless answers that literature offers. Uh, some of the greatest, most current writers and thinkers are a part of our virtual and on-ground journey, including no less than four Nobel Prize winners. Abhijit Banerjee will join us on ground, and three of them, you go back to the digital program, you will find some incredible learnings. We platform and amplify writing from the margins across the Indian languages, and this is what is most important to me. And our program reflects the rich diversity of India, as well as the splendors of world literature. From the domestic to the cosmic, the personal to the political, the material to the abstract, we look at it all, philosophy and whimsy, music and laughter. We study war and peace and the paradoxes that surround the present. We explore the enigmatic world of viruses, how they have shaped the earth. We have a session called the urgency of bor borrowed time because we seem to have forgotten that the planet is also ticking away while uh, the um, uh, nuclear things get closer and the poets get despair more and more. While all of us despair, we discuss geopolitics, climate justice, environmental and ecological issues. We search the roots of democracy and the hurts and fissures across caste, across color, across gender. The lockdowns and solitude that accompanied the pandemic has led to a burst of passionate, reflective and inspired writing. I, I wrote three books in this time. And I know so many of my friends who just sat down and write because there was very little else to do sometimes. We are proud to present outstanding debut novelists, prize winning authors, Booker and Sahitya Academy Award, these Nobel laureates in startling, stellar poetry and prose. Our 15th edition invested in multilinguality as ever, uh, features this year over 25 languages across online and offline programming. Our emphasis on translations stresses their crucial importance in accessing and in appreciating world literatures. We are, I'm speaking to an English, but in our minds, we are not stuck in the English language alone. We look forward to seeing you on ground virtually at the Living Library, indeed the Library of Life, that is the Jaipur Literature Festival. Join us for renewal, for healings, transformative learnings that come from our shared narratives. Above all, thank you for being here today. And uh, my co-director, William Dalrymple, will tell you a little more. Thank you. As my esteemed co-director, just said, it's, I think it's true that authors are probably the only group who actually flourished in uh, uh, lockdown. We, the thing that stops us writing is coming to festivals like this, going to parties, doing anything other than writing. And uh, suddenly we were confronted with a situation where uh, we, we all produced more books in, in, in two years than we have in the previous 10. Uh, but it's very, very nice not to be in our studies today. Um, I think the pandemic has been hard for everyone, but the performing arts in particular have found it an existential threat and um, uh, all the sort of work that Sanjoy and Teamworks do uh, with performing arts, with music, with dance, with theatre have had their lives very, very severely threatened uh, by the economics of the lockdown. But now we are back uh, and how in this wonderful new venue. And with, as, as uh, Namata said, four Nobel Prize winners. I mean, I don't know how many of you go to lots of other literary festivals around the world, but no one gets four, four Nobel Prize winners in one year. It's a kind of unique thing. Plus, we have this year's Booker winner, and um, this year's Sahatya Academy winner is our co-director. So uh, it's a sort of spectacular uh, lineup. I promised a number of years ago that I wouldn't tell my story about the Japanese tourists. <laughs> but as we've been away two years, I'm going to do it again. When, <laughs> when we started this festival for the first time, uh, you're welcome to groan when we hit the punchline. Um, we only had a, a few people 
uh, to fill the Durba Hall. We frantically were going around trying to uh, shove people in and, and sort of try and fill the seats available in the wonderful diggy Durba Hall. Uh, and we were very relieved when a group of Japanese tourists who got lost looking for a mayor came and for, in a rather muddled manner filled the back of the room for 10 minutes before realizing it wasn't a mayor palace uh, and heading on uh, their way again. Um, but by 2020, before the pandemic, we had half a million footfalls. Uh, the success of Jaipur inspired a whole galaxy of other literary festivals, not only in India, but in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Nepal, and Myanmar. We are surprised as we are proud of this, but this really is the mother of Indian literary festivals. And there could be no better place for it to be than Jaipur, uh, because Jaipur has a long tradition of performing arts. Its court uh, was one of the leading patrons uh, of writing and poetry uh, in a number of different languages uh, throughout its, its uh, life, first in Amer, then in Jaipur. Uh, and uh, it is, there could not be a more suitable site for a literary festival than Jaipur. Um, this year, we have so much to offer that we barely know where to begin. We have gathered talent from around the globe, from Zanzibar to Montreal, Caribbean to Indonesia, Hollywood, Istanbul, and Brick Lane. Uh, we have writers of genius hotching in every venue at every point. Um, particularly excited, of course, to have had uh, this year's uh, Nobel Laureate for Literature, Abdul Razak Ghana, but also this year's Booker winner, Damon Galgut, his predecessors, Booker winners, Monica Ali and DBC Pierre. We have uh, arguably America's most acclaimed writer at the moment, Jonathan Franzen, uh, Turkish superstar Elif Shafak, uh, the wonderful Irish David Mitchell and Combe Toybin, two of the most read authors uh, of uh, Irish literature in the world. We have this year's Bailey Gifford winner for nonfiction, uh, Patrick Radden Keefe telling the extraordinary story of opioids, uh, Harvard's Vincent Brown on slave result of revolts, Stephen Pinker on reason, Charlotte Higgins talking about Greek myths, Benjamin Brose on Xuanzang, Robert McFarlane on nature writing, Rupert Everett on Hollywood. We can go on forever. It's an extraordinary lineup. And so I would just like to say, welcome back. Let the games begin. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, William. Thank you, Namita. Uh, let us now light the ceremonial lamp, light of knowledge, and declare this incredible festival open. May I please request Honorable Minister of Tourism, Government of Rajasthan, Shri Vishwendra Singh Ji, to please come on stage. Festival Director, Namita Gokhale. Festival Director, William Dalrymple. Mrs. Faith Singh. Vera Mikhalski, our venue partner and representing the Jan Mikhalski Foundation, our country partner, ambassador of Royal Norwegian Embassy, His Excellency Hans Jakob Friedenlund, our host, our beautiful host, Apurv Kumar and Timmy Kumar, to please come on stage.
Ladies and gentlemen, now may I please request Honorable Minister of Tourism, Government of Rajasthan, Sri Vishwendra Singh Ji, to please say a few words. Your Excellencies, my esteemed audience here, all the dignitaries that have come from far away, from different countries, from different states, I welcome you all to Jaipur and a warm welcome after COVID. It is a matter of great pride for the Department of Tourism, the Government of Rajasthan, and all hospitality fraternity that are after a gap of two years. JLF is again happening and it's a matter of great happiness for all of us. And I congratulate the tourism fraternity, organizers of JLF and tourism officials that have been able to ramp up this whole preparation for putting such a great show for all of us. Rich culture, glorious history has always been the hallmarks of, been, always been the hallmarks of Rajasthan, even in difficult circumstances. Following this tradition under the able leadership of honorable Chief Minister Shri Ashok Gailoji, continuous efforts are being made by the state government for the development of tourism in Rajasthan. The efforts made by the state government for control and treatment of the midst of global crisis of COVID epidemic were appreciated in the country and abroad, and by the way, including the Prime Minister. At the same time, the local tourism units were also provided necessary reliefs by the state government tourist entrepreneurs of Rajasthan also play an important role in this effort and the state government is providing as, them as much support as possible. Rajasthan is the first state in the country to introduce a new tourism policy. After the spread of COVID epidemic and to declare tourism as an industry, that is a very, only a hotelier like Mr. Apoor will understand what I mean, who owns this hotel. So this is, <laughs> Though this is not only the COVID affected tourism business will be strengthened through this, a visionary model of developing new tourism attractions, et cetera, has been established. And this year, the state government, the Honorable Chief Minister has given 1000 crores to the tourism budget, which I think is a very, very, very generous gesture. Now, I'd like to go off the official speech and be a little more explanatory. See, we've gone, all gone through it. And the worst hit, which was the largest bread earner of the state, was the tourism department and the tourism sector. And we have been worst hit. Hotels have been shut. People have had to sell some properties, close some hotels. And now I am, excellencies, please don't mind, but I know, and I, we all know that foreign footfall is not going to be there for the next one and a half years. So I am going full on for domestic tourism. And I will make sure 
that in my tenure, that we are back on our feet and that people very soon will start coming from abroad and they will also feel safe in every which way. So, and I request you all today to help us in that endeavor. We are doing several things. We are doing cultural tourism. We are going to do uh, river cruises. Then, by the way, I also have the civil aviation department. We have 19 runways in Rajasthan. I propose to get them, most of them going so that we can give air connectivity to tourism where in different parts of Rajasthan, remote parts of Rajasthan. In that, this is my vision. This is my thought and I can't do it alone. So whoever is sitting here, whichever country you represent or whichever state you come from or whichever, even local, if I re request you all to leave here with an oath that each one of you are going to be the brand ambassadors of Rajasthan tourism. It will make me very, very happy. I thank Mr. Roy and everybody else and Mr. Purva, my friend, and all the people here for giving me this opportunity to be amongst you all. Thank you. Jai Hind. That's very kind of you. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to invite our first keynote speaker of the day, Mr. Harish Trivedi. Harish Trivedi is a former professor of English at the University of Delhi and a visiting professor at the universities of Chicago and London. He has authored a book on the history of South Asian literature. Among his other books, he has translated from Hindi into English, Prem Chand, A Life, and co-editing Kipling in India, India in Kipling. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Harish Trivedi. Namita. Shanjoy, William, distinguished guests before me, what a privilege and a joy it is. Is something wrong with it? Yeah. You know, whenever I take these three names, something happens with the mic. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try that again. <laughs> I was naming the three moving spirits at this festival, Namita, Shonjo, and William. And I was also addressing all of you, distinguished guests, literature lovers, what a joy it is to be here. How nice to have JLF back on the ground, grounded, and us old suspects to be back at the JLF. And with the change, all of us recidivists at the JLF, among us who did not dig Diggy, who was not in love with Diggy Palace. And now we are at a new venue, a more capacious venue, I'm told a safer venue for crowd management. And I'm sure many things will change and much will remain the same, including the two things that this festival is famous for, best known for perhaps, the spirit and the ambience. These changes happen. As the Bhagavad Gita says, which has something to say about everything in the world as we know. The body sheds old clothes and puts on new ones. The spirit sheds old bodies and puts on new ones. Also says this festival sheds an old venue and begins to inhabit a new one. As I said about the spirit, 
and the USP, as it were, of this festival. Mention was made of some other festivals, the Sahit Academy, who have a festival going on right now, to which Namita is not going, as she told us. But uh, I am going in the middle of this festival because there are many things not in common between the two festivals, but there are some things in common. They choose their keynote speaker very, very fussily, and they have chosen me this year just as the JLF has. So I'll do and in three days time, I'll do another keynote. <laughs> About this festival, Mirza Ghalib also had something to say in the context of other festivals. They've all said something about everything. The famous Urdu poet Mirza Ghalib. Hai aur bhi dunia mein festival bohat achche. Hai aur bhi dunia mein festival bohat achche. Kehte hain ki Jaipur ka hai mahal hi gushor. Let's maintain the mahal and not only the speakers, but the listeners are also very much a part of the mahal. When one is invited to speak at the beginning of a big event like this, one is immediately possessed by delusions of grandeur. One wishes to say something earth shatteringly new and something ineffably profound. A famous Shakespeare scholar, wise old Shakespeare scholar once said, anyone who claims to say something new about Shakespeare must be wrong. But let me have a shot. My subject that I have chosen for this is the correlation between life on the one hand and literature on the other. Before I do that, however, in a true scholarly and professorial spirit, let me quickly recapitulate some old formulations that wise people before me have left behind. The first one I ever came across in junior school was Sahitya Samaj ka darpan hai. And I was delighted. I think Namita has not only won a prize this year, the coveted Sahitya Academy Prize, she has also done something for the first time in the history of this festival to speak in Hindi at the inaugural. That is marvelous. Hindi, the local language, the language of Jaipur, the language of North India, the language of India, wonderful. It's been heard in many sessions before, but not, I think, in the inaugural before. How it has? All right, even more wonderful. Sahitya Samaj ka darpan hai. I did not know that this gem of Hindi wisdom was in fact a version of an English saying, which I came across later, literature holds up a mirror to society. And even later I found out that this formulation in English was a variant on, and I quote, Literature is a mere imitation of life. Mere? Who said that? Plato said that. Plato did not like literature. In the Arabic language, Plato, who is called Platon in Greek, is called Aflatun. Now, if you say negative and mindless things about literature, you have proof that you are an Aflatun. Many years after Plato, and I'm cutting a very long story short. I'm coming to 1936, after Plato, the 9th of April, 1936, on which date in Lucknow at the Rifahe Arm Hall, Prem Chand, the Urdu Hindi writer, said, Sahitya Samaj ke aage chalne wali mashal hai. Literature is a torch that walks a step or two in front of life, illuminating it and showing it, lighting up the way before it. Some decades after that, in more recent times, the Hindi poet, Kuvar Narayan, Gyanpeet winner, made an oblique statement about the value of literature and its relation to life. He said, Koi chahe, to ji sakta hai kavita ke bina bhi jeevan. If you insist, you can indeed live a life without poetry. But what he meant was, this life certainly would not be worth living. 
The last old formulation I wish to cite is by the American literary critic Lionel Trilling and my fellow keynote speaker, Mr. Sharp, is an economist by training, but his wife, who looked more intelligent even last evening, has a, has a degree in English, and she knows about Lionel Trilling. He suggested, Lionel Trilling, that when we read a book, that book reads us as well. This is a startling and utterly illuminating insight. It's also very scary. He said, Trilling, that he had been read by T.S. Eliot's Wasteland, by Joyce's Ulysses, and by Proust's Remembrance of Things Past, and other similar classics. So what happened? He reported, and I quote, some of these books at first rejected me. I bored them. But as I, grew, as I grew older and they knew me better, they came to have more sympathy and understand my hidden meanings. Let me pause here to give a shout out to The Wasteland. It was published exactly 100 years ago, typeset by T.S. Eliot's Dear friends, Leonard and Virginia Woolf. And there is a book coming out later this year in which some of us have been invited to say whether that hard to please poem and we readers of it are getting along any better now. We have now arrived at the point where I will reveal my own formulation of the link between literature and language. My formulation is, Literature is a translation of life. And since we, the readers, represent life in this equation, what literature translates is us. In this view, <clears throat> literature is not mimesis or mere imitation. It is not a reflection or even a refraction. It is, alas, not a guiding light of life either. Rather, it is the rendering of life from one language into another. I mean by translation here something different from what is meant by that word most of the time. So what are these two languages between which this translation takes place? In any act of translation, there is the language that we know and the language that we do not know. In this case, which is which? I suggest that life is the language that we do not know. And literature is the language that we do know. That's because life is too chaotic, random, unpredictable, and untamable, indomitable for us quite to know it. Literature, on the other hand, is more shapely and more organic in form more imaginative and pleasurable in, in scope, and more coherent and gently persuasive in meaning. And that is how literature can be said to make us help, to help us make sense of life in the way that a translation helps us make sense of a text that we do not know in the original. Socrates said that an unexamined life is not worth living, something like Kuan Narayan. What I'm suggesting is not entirely different for an unexamined life is only one step away from a mediated life and an interpreted life. Therefore, translation can render anything into another language. It must interpret what it is translating. It must make cognitive choices and exercise aesthetic selectivity. It is often said that much is lost in translation. Let us ask what is gained in translation? And the answer is a whole new book is gained, which we would never have been able to read and to read otherwise. Similarly, in literature, the reader in each book gains a new life through that book. 
and also gains a whole new way of looking at life, such as projected by the author of that book. With each book that we read, another life is gained, and we can live without ever having lived it. And another way is gained of looking at life that we would not have known otherwise. I'm now skipping a very vital paragraph, which I will use in some other keynote. In fact, I see literature and life put together as an open book, rather like a volume of facing page translations, where we have the original on the left hand and the translation on the right hand page. We can look at without grasping the strange script in which our life is inscribed, and then we can understand what it means if we lift our gaze and look away at the other page, which is literature. I will conclude by reading out an extract about a poem from Ukraine in Ukrainian by a Ukrainian poet. It begins, when I am dead, bury me in my beloved Ukraine. The question I ask is, why was this poet not already living in Ukraine when he wrote this poem? And the answer I found out, this poet is Shevchenko, Taras Shevchenko. He's bigger in Ukraine as a poet and as a painter than any poet or painter put together in India and in most countries. Shevchenko, he died in 1861 in a different time. Where was he when he wrote this poem in the 1840s? When I am dead, bury me in my beloved Ukraine. He was living in Russia. He was living in the capital of Imperial Russia in St. Petersburg. And why? Not because he was banished from Ukraine, but because he had gone there to earn name and fame and some money. And in 1860, the year before he died, he was made a fellow of the Imperial Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg. That's how these two countries and languages and literatures and art have been intertwined over the years. I'll read out, the, and what it means is that language and literature can cross borders easily and effortlessly and naturally. But when it comes to some strong leaders of the world wanting to cross borders, it's a very different proposition. Those leaders should become readers. They should be forced to read more literature, preferably in translation. I will conclude the by reading out the last part of this poem, of which I quoted the first two lines by Shevchenko. When I'm dead, bury me in my beloved Ukraine, and then after a few lines, oh, bury me, then rise you up and break your heavy chains and water with the tyrant's blood, the freedom you have gained. And in that great new family, the family of the free, with softly spoken kindly word, remember, also me. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Harish Trivedi. Allow me to now invite our second keynote speaker. And, and after this session, we will be opening to our first session here at the front lawn. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Shompi Sharp, the UN resident coordinator for India since November 2021, he has devoted more than 25 years of his career to promoting inclusive and sustainable development internationally. Within the organization, he most recently served as United Nations resident coordinator in Armenia after holding several leadership positions at the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Sharp has published works in health economics and was a United States agency for International Development Policy Champion 
as well as a nominee for the UNDP Administrators Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Shampi Sharp. Namaskar. Good morning, uh, everybody. As a, um, a recent arrival uh, to India, and on behalf of the United Nations system in India, it's a true honor to be uh, here with all of you today. My first opportunity to enjoy the legendary uh, greatest literary show on earth, uh, JLF, and uh, to be here in this beautiful uh, pink city of Jaipur. Uh, I wanted to, to thank uh, Sanjay and, and Sanjoy and, and um, Namita and William for bringing us all here together today, as well as uh, the many people connected online across the world. The list of JLF speakers and, and indeed this audience uh, here in front of me is so impressive, I have to say, as to be rather intimidating. And uh, you can imagine it's quite difficult to follow Harish uh, after such a, a fabulous um, offering. So at least if I bar, uh, bore you, I do know that there are apparently some election results you can be checking on your phone. So um, just, just in case. And in fact, the JLF recipe has been so successful that there are now, I understand, JLFs in many different cities across the world, including my alma mater uh, and my wife's uh, alma mater in Boulder, Colorado. But I have to say, so welcome, uh, hello to anybody in Boulder who's watching. Um, but I have to say, I am the luckiest to be here in the original um, uh, Jaipur version of this amazing festival. Muche Jaipur Meakar. Bohat Kushi Hui. Trying it as, as well, Harish, a little bit of the Hindi for this uh, festival. So, dear friends, um, as we have heard, we are living in extremely difficult times as we struggle to emerge from this disastrous COVID pandemic, having learned how fragile is the fabric that connects our world we still see war and conflict in so many different parts of the world. And right now, as we meet Ukraine, the invasion, the senseless invasion of Ukraine is reminding us all that in addition to the horrific human cost unfolding, our continued dependence on fossil fuels means greater vulnerability for all countries to external geopolitical, and environmental shocks, a vicious confluence of war, pandemic, and climate change. Now, please imagine, if you will, in Orissa, a tribal girl mourns the loss of her ancestral forests and her people's livelihoods. Once lush forests reduced to barren scrubland. A few hours away on the coast, a young man surveys the destruction left by a cyclone, the waves coming closer, threatening to swallow his village. In rural Uttar Pradesh, a teenage girl despairs that her community doesn't know the very air they breathe, polluted by industry and dirty cooking fuels, is harming their health and shortening their lives. Yet, what you just imagined is not imagination at all. These are real stories of actual young Indians at the front lines of the triple planetary crisis, nature, biodiversity loss, climate change, and pollution. Launching the latest intergovernmental planet on climate change, itself a piece of literature, just a few weeks ago, the UN Secretary General called the latest science an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. We must move with urgency towards building resilience and adapting to this new reality. As uh, Sandra was saying to me last night, we need to be on a climate change war footing. Sandra also said that we need to make climate action more sexy, but that's a, that's a theme I'll, I'll leave to you. In all seriousness, colleagues, the IPCC shows that India will be among the countries 
worst hit by the triple planetary crisis. Already fragile ecosystems are irreversibly being damaged. India's coastal cities are set to experience disastrous flooding as sea levels rise. Many cities will experience heat and humidity beyond human tolerance. Globally, since 2015, the last seven years have been the hottest on record and nearly 20 of the last 20 years. So I don't need to tell the people of Rajasthan what an even hotter world would look like. Globally, cases of vector-borne diseases may rise, not to mention the future variants of COVID as humans and animals are pushed further into conflict. Yet there is hope for optimism. The UN Climate Summit in Glasgow a few months ago saw the world come together and take steps to meet targets and set targets of limiting the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. Every fraction of this counts. And we saw countries, including India, commit to net zero emissions. Here in India, I see hope. I find inspiration in the young people on the front lines of the climate battle, offering us solutions and adaptations. That grieving girl from Orissa I mentioned has grown into a strong young woman, Archana Soreng, who is now advocating tirelessly to bring indigenous perspectives and forest protection practices into the climate discourse. The young man on the coast, Sumya Biswal, is working passionately for nature-based solutions including replanting mangrove forests to protect his community and marine life. The teenage girl from Uttar Pradesh, Hina Saifi, is now educating her community on how to protect themselves from air pollution and generate clean energy through solar power. And yesterday, I had the amazing opportunity to sit with an entire community of women, men, girls, and boys, and the young Sarpanch, Mr. Ratore of Johota village, about an hour from here, under a banyan tree, learning how they are embracing flagship programs like Jal Jivan, Swach Bharat, Imregna, with their own village activ uh, activism to realize their own vision of a village that is clean, resilient, plastic free, and a vibrant hub of life. These are just some of the examples of the inspiring young people and communities offering innovative solutions that the UN in India is proud to be partnering with. So dear colleagues, India has emerged as a leading force in development for all, a champion of multilateralism and a leader in climate action. That is something we must together nurture and accelerate. Since arriving in India, I have been deeply impressed by the deeply rooted philosophy and values of sustainability I see everywhere in the Indian culture. This is articulated, for example, in the government's uh, proposal upcoming for a whole society behavioral transformation called LIFE, a lifestyle for environment today. If 1.3 billion people take mindful steps each in their consumption habits, recycling, conserving energy, turning to renewables, we can generate massive collective action. There is a collective urgent need to tackle climate change. And somebody once told me, don't say but, say and. And there is a fundamental right to development. India's ambitious targets demonstrate to the world that climate action does not and cannot mean sacrificing equitable development. The government of India's Panchamri targets announced at COP26, including the addition of 500 gigawatts of renewable capacities and meeting 50% energy demands through renewables, understands that investment in green energy delivers economic and climate benefits. And at the global level, India is accelerating the solar power revolution through initiatives such as the International Solar Alliance. Apart from these commitments, India has now announced uh, the launch of a national hydrogen mission to boost clean energy and make India the new global hub of green energy, green hydrogen. And leaders of India's dynamic business sector are increasingly on the cutting edge of clean energy and climate friendly technologies, companies like Tata, like Mahindra and others. So the economic case for clean energy 
is clear. Investments in renewable energy generate three times more jobs than investments in polluting fossil fuels. I would also like to highlight the urgent need to take action on plastic waste, a major driver of the triple planetary crisis. And I commend the government for its ban on single-use plastics upcoming from this July. And efforts at the national and especially at the state levels are increasingly improving the infrastructural and the behavioral change factors for resilience, such as in Orisa, as I mentioned, where threats from the sea are being steadily reduced. Dear friends, in closing, I want to say that India is rightfully calling for climate justice. Yet out of the $100 billion in climate finance promised by high-income countries in 2015, too little has materialized. This must change, and India's upcoming leadership of the G20 presents an ideal platform to hold countries accountable and to work together in true partnership. As the IPCC report tells us, we must take urgent action to have global CO2 emissions by 2030, and the world must achieve carbon neutrality to keep 1.5 alive. We have no plan B, we have no planet B. A transition to renewables is the only pathway to achieving this and achieving energy security, universal access, and green jobs that India and the world need. Here to realize an amazing demographic dividend potential over the next 25 years. All in India, everyone in this room, all of you online, we must commit to throwing our weight together, the full weight together to tackle the triple planetary crisis. Together we are an irresistible force, as Sandra might say, an irresistibly sexy force for climate action. Mujhe ap sab sabe milkar bohat acha laga. Bohat danyavad. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Shampi Sharp. A big and heartfelt thank you to each one of you present here today and for beginning the Jaipur Literature Festival 2022. It's going to be one spectacular ride. Thank you so much for supporting the festival. Thank you for being here. May I now please hand the stage to our venue manager, Rijul Kataria. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if I do this from here, it will be improper. So I'm going to come center stage and do a big namaskar to all of you first. Um, Namaskar and welcome to the 15th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Detol, Banega Swast India, and a big heartfelt welcome to the front lawn. Uh, if you could just give us a couple of minutes, we're setting up for the next session, and we'll, we'll be with you shortly. So please don't go anywhere, grab your seats, hold on to them, because you're in for a special ride. They take a talk in a talk, Kirnaka, the 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 K